This is part two of an interview with Dan Atkinson, AKA Fly Fish Dan, and we're diving deep into how he built his YouTube channel to 20,000 subscribers. So stick around. So let's switch gears a little bit and let's start, let's talk a little bit about your YouTube journey. I think one of the things that has been really fun to watch is how, at least for me, it, it may not feel that way for you, but um, is how quickly um, you've grown and how big you've grown. Um, and it's been fun to watch um, the community that's sort of grown up around you. Um, and I think it's, it's also fun, like when we go fishing, how many people recognize you um, on the river, uh, you know, and have heard of you and are like, hey, are you, you know, how are you fly fish, Dan? Talk a little bit about how you got started doing YouTube. So that is a great question. How I got started with YouTube. Uh, it started right as the pandemic started. And like with a lot of people, there was a lot of fear that surrounded the pandemic. And I got stuck into watching all the bad news, right? The, the, the pandemic, the civil unrest that was happening uh, back in 2020. And my wife, as I was beginning to record the news so I could watch all the bad news when I got home from work, my wife just said, you know, Dan, you need to do, you need to focus your energy on, on something else, something that's positive, not this negativity. And she was right. And she actually suggested, you know, why don't you go start a YouTube channel? I'm like, a YouTube channel? What am I going to do with that? And, you know, it's, it's a funny story. I don't think I'll ever show you the first clip I ever recorded, but it was terrible. It was so bad. But um, I started it because I needed a positive distraction for myself, right? And um, I wanted something that, that you know, it, it, it of course needed to be authentic. Um, I didn't want to create a persona. I just wanted to be me and you know me, Mark, I'm, I'm an optimist. And, and I just wanted to, it started out as that positive distraction for me and what it turned out to, and you mentioned it before with, with people now recognizing me while I'm out there fly fishing, it's been this humbling experience because it is also resonating with others in a very positive way. And it's, it's humbling when I get these messages about, you know, people that reach out to me and say, you know, you inspired me to get back out there or, you, you know, you inspired me to, to fly fish more or, or uh, even spouses of, of people that have watched my videos just thanking me for bringing happiness into somebody's life. And, and it's shocking, right? When you first see that message, super humbling but it's, it's just turned into this um, just a very positive place to be. And it's just me doing what I do and what I'm passionate about and sharing all of my experiences and trying to teach as much as I can as well. But, but that's how it kind of all started. And um, the growth, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been, it's been fun to watch. I mean, there's a lot of hard work that goes into it as well. I started to study and learn YouTube and, and understand, you know, both in re different things you can do with retention factors and things like that. It's, it's, um, and I've learned to create videos with some help, right? I've had some help Mark from you, right? With, uh, my storytelling and my editing from James, uh, who's, uh, which is another story in itself on how we met. Um, and when I got that help, all of a sudden the, the quality of the videos it got a lot better and, and people could engage with it more just because I became a better storyteller uh, in the editing room. And that's when really things really started to grow for me. Um, and you know, it doesn't feel like work. Uh, when you're sharing your passion, uh, that's fly fishing with others that are also passionate about the sport. I, I almost enjoy the creative process as much as I like the fishing because I can go back and tell the story. It's, it's so much fun for me to do. Do you find that the filming ever takes away from your experience? And like, do you ever go out and you're just like, today, I'm not, I'm not going to film. I'm not going to make an episode. I'm just going to go out and, and fish and not think about that stuff. So I have, I've had a few, a few times that I've gone out and, and just fished and it's, and it's not because I was either tired of filming or, um, you know, didn't want to do it or didn't want to share it. I might just have a, a time and it's usually on multi-day trips. I just want to go out there and fish. 
and just enjoy enjoy everything there is in fly fishing and have that to myself. Um, but I also find that it's not it's not work for me to do this. And in fact, in some ways, the filming process has enhanced the fishing because I, I never feel like I'm by myself. <laughs> um, early on, I envisioned my phone or the camera that I was using because I primarily use my iPhone as someone that has taken the time to watch the video. And I speak to that person as if they are on, just like I'm speaking to you, like if there's a live person on the other side because at the end of the day, when I'm done editing, there is someone, a live person that's taken the time to watch the video. So I speak to them directly. And it's, it almost feels like now when I'm fishing and filming, I've got someone with me. It's, it's a strange thing to try to describe, but I don't feel like I'm alone. It's like I'm, I'm out there fishing with that one person that's taken the time to click on the video and, and watch and share it with me. So it's, it doesn't like work. That's really cool. Talking about filming gear, can you talk about how, how you started out your YouTube channel and sort of how that gear has progressed um, to today? So that, that first video that I told you that you'll never see, <laughs> that was was used with my it's like a sony dslr is that what it is dsr whatever um but it was terrible so and it was a kind of an older camera that had a video setting but the audio was awful so i quickly abandoned that and then i decided you know what i'm just gonna hold out my iphone with a you know i have a built-in selfie stick with my long arms so I just started using the iPhone. So I had the iPhone 12. And then when the iPhone 13 came out with cinematic mode, of course, I had to experiment with that. Um, I use my iPhone primarily and exclusively all the way up to the point to where I got a GoPro. And the only reason why I got a GoPro was because I was tired of sticking my iPhone underwater for the underwater release shots. Because when you bring the phone back up, the mics were full of full of water for probably 20 to 30 minutes after. And the audio is really muffled, which can be distracting. It certainly was for me distracting. So I have a GoPro Hero 8 just for the underwater shots now. So I don't have to put my iPhone under the water, but it's waterproof. So if something disastrous happens that I drop it, which I've done before. Um, but you know, cell phone technology today arguably is better than anything you can buy in a traditional camera. I mean, I can shoot in 4K, 60 frames per second. The audio is excellent on the iPhone, arguably better than what I've looked on on YouTube when I was originally searching for different cameras. Small and compact. It's just super easy to use, intuitive. I mean, we all know how to use our smartphones. So I don't foresee myself, and until I have a camera crew, Mark, I don't foresee myself using anything but this. That's cool. Um, I, I like that you've kept it um, so simple for so long and had so much success. Um, I know while you have a um, a fetish for buying lots of fly rods, like I drool over cameras and camera lenses and camera accessories. Um, but I think it's great that like you are showing people that being successful at YouTube is not about the gear. It's not about having a super fancy camera with lenses and gimbals and microphones. It's just about getting out and shooting stories and being a good storyteller. And, and like you said, like your the, the footage that you get from your, from the phone is, is amazing. I mean, I use the, um, I use my phone as well and I mix it in and I find that like when I go on certain kinds of trips, like backpacking trip, I just leave my big camera and stuff at home and I just take my phone and, and just shoot the whole time on that. And it, it does a great job. What other gear are you using besides a cell phone and, and a GoPro? Anything else? Now, to be fair, this is my third iPhone <laughs> because I have an iPhone at the bottom of Coldwater Lake. One iPhone at the bottom of Mayfield Lake. So I have spent a little bit of money because I keep having to replace the iPhones. So I actually modified my chest mount to have less likely of it ever falling out. Um, so I just want to clarify that, right? It's uh, I have unfortunately had to buy a few, a few iPhones because I've dropped them. I have a drone. And that's also been a bit of an expense because I got overconfident 
uh, thinking that I could fly it well and flew it into a tree and then it fell onto the ground and broke into a lot of pieces. And then recently I was fishing over on Eastern Washington and I was getting this epic shot of Mount Rainier and all of a sudden my control just shut down and the, the drone was looking around and wondering where to go and it finally just died. So if somebody's hiking in and around Mount Rainier and see a drone, A, I'm sorry, and B, I'd love to be able to have, have that back. Um, but I use the drone for just to kind of, it really has kind of enhanced the experience, right? It kind of it gives the viewers a better idea of where I'm fishing, right? Because a lot of times if it's just first person and you're right down on the river or lake, you can't really get a sense of what's around you. So I've tried to incorporate a lot of the drone footage into just kind of being able to paint a picture of, of this very unique place that I might be fishing. That's cool. Do you have any, do you mind telling uh, viewers what model that you're using? And like, would you recommend somebody to go out as their first drone and get that? Yeah, the DJI Mini 2. So I would recommend anyone that's that's looking for a drone, the DJI, I always call it a GGI. It's not, it's DJI Mini 2. Um, it is super intuitive. It's tiny. I mean, the thing is tiny. In fact, I have it right here. I'll show you just how small this thing is. It is so small. I can put this, I can put the drone, you can see it's tiny, the controller, and three batteries in my sling pack. So part of the reason why I get so much footage with the drone is because it's with me in my sling pack. So it doesn't take up any more room than three fly boxes would in the sling pack. And it's just easy to use, super lightweight, um, sets up in minutes, and I'm flying. The, the only downside, uh, and kind of circling back to the crash that I had, it only has downward looking sensors. So you do have to be cognizant of where you're flying. Uh, because you could fly it right into a wall and it wouldn't stop. So that's the only downside, but it's it's small enough to where you don't need to have all the registration, right? It's it's under, what, 249 grams, I think it is. So you don't need to register it. You don't need to, to do all of the, the, the crazy stuff that anything heavier would be in drones. And it's super compact and very easy to use. If someone goes out, gets their first drone, any like a couple tips on like how you would suggest they use it to get the most effect? One of the hardest things to do is to film yourself with a drone catching a fish. But if you can manage to do that, that does give a, a pretty cool element when when you're playing the fish, right? Because a lot of times I'll have I have a separate iPhone that operates the drone, so my primary iPhone is still filming whatever is happening. So I can go back and forth between the shot from the drone and my iPhone. It just is more of an immersive experience when you can do something like that. But typically what I use the drone for is to, is to be able to, to really show anyone that might be watching where it is that I'm fishing, the mountainous regions or the old growth forest. So it's generally, uh, landscape type of pictures, whether it's the river or the lake or the, or what's around me. And sometimes of myself giving, giving the viewer a unique experience of seeing me from above fishing and then uh, cutting down to where I'm right down there fishing on the river. So it just kind of enhances the viewing experience that takes a lot more time to do that. Um, so typically I use, use the drone just to kind of enhance, uh, and show the viewer where it is I'm fishing and just kind of you know, when you're out there, you, you're taking everything in. It's harder to do that when you just have a singular camera. So I try to show everyone what exactly I'm feeling and seeing when I'm out there fishing. Cool. So you started in uh, beginning of COVID. Um, that would be 2020. Is that right? Yeah, it was uh, May of 2020, I think, was my first video that I launched, which was terrible. <laughs> but yes, that was my first video. <laughs> Since that time, how many videos do you think you've published? I know exactly how many because YouTube constantly tells you. Um, I have 510 videos. Now, to be fair, half of those are shorts. The other half are long format videos. So in format videos, it's about 250. 
and short format videos, it's about the same, a little over 250. That's that's still really impressive. That's a lot of it. That's a lot of long form video that you've put out. That's amazing. It is. It is definitely a long, long, a lot of long format. But remember, I can a lot of times film um, four videos per trip. So it's not 250 trips necessarily. Um, but I, I, when I'm out there filming, I think about things that I can either teach or show or review while I'm out there fly fishing. So I, I'm able to build a lot of content around just one trip. And that's, that's how I can consistently upload uh, videos without having to be fishing all the time. I think that's a, a power tip for uh, outdoor uh, YouTubers. One of the things that they talk about when you're learning about YouTubing is becoming more efficient um, producing videos. And one of those things is batch recording stuff. Like, you know, a lot of people will batch record in their you know, home studio so they can write up like three or four videos and they can just sit down in a couple hours and record them. Um, and I've always thought that, that was a little unfair because as outdoor YouTubers, like we go out and we're doing a video about our adventure or experience. But when I talked with you about this idea of batch recording while being out doing your experience, out fishing, um, that was kind of a mind blowing um, concept for me that I I'd never thought about like, you could go out and you could plan and shoot three, two, three, four videos in one trip. And um, I think for people that are listening to this, that are looking to uh, build their YouTube channel, like really think about that when you guys are out there, what else can you be teaching or showing or, or whatever while you're out there? And a lot of times it's spontaneous. Um, like for example, I recently went on a fishing trip and I lost a fly, right? And we, we do that often, right? Get it stuck in a tree or stuck in a branch or a root underneath the water. Well, I lost a fly and then I thought to myself, wow, thank goodness I've got another one just like this because the fly was working. And I thought, here's a tip, right? A lot of, a lot of newer fly fishers might just buy one of a particular fly, right? If I would have done that, I'd have been done. I had a fly that was working. I was catching a lot of fish and then I lost it. If I didn't have a backup, then I would have been screwed. No more fish, at least on that fly. So I thought to myself, well, here's something, right, that someone that's relatively new to fly fishing might want to know. So I try to incorporate, and a lot of times it's spontaneous, of things that that are happening in the moment that I thought, okay, here's a, here's a fly fishing tip that somebody might want to know. So on the spot, I will film an intro to this new video idea that I have while fishing, and then know that I can B roll in some of the experience that I just had in the trip and then do an outro in the end. And I might have a two to three minute video of whatever it is that I feel that somebody new to fly fishing might want to know. And that's how I can build so much content um, and give the perception that I'm fishing all the time because I'm, Sometimes it's with a plan, but a lot of times it's just spontaneous when I'm out there fishing. Um, can you talk a little bit about your process from like you, you head out on your trip, you film, you come back and you edit and you upload, like what is your process for that? What are you thinking, um, out on the river? Like what kind of things are you, uh, making sure that you film? Um, and then like, yeah, how do you process that and then upload that? So a lot of times it's spontaneous. Um, I have in mind that I want to go fishing and then I think about where I want to go. And a lot of times during the drive over, I'll think about what experience do I want to, to show on the video. I've done videos where I fish in the rain and it's just about this, the quietness that happens when you fish in the rain, just listening to the raindrops on the water, on your float tube, on your, on your rain gear. And I try to make that as immersive as I can. So I find myself filming droplets of water coming off of trees or small little creeks that are, that are, uh, you know, flowing into the lake or close up of the raindrops hitting, hitting the lake, the lake surface to tr just try to capture that experience. So a lot of times I'm, it's spontaneous. I'm thinking about what I want to do both on the drive there and I'll find inspiration while I'm fishing as well. But that lens, when you do that, it lends to a lot 
of footage that you necessarily don't need, right? When I first started doing this, I had so much footage to try to sift through. It was almost overwhelming when it, when it came time to be in the editing room. So what I found now that works really well is that I, I will film two to three minute increments. And if nothing interesting happens, right? And I'm just doing my thing fishing. If nothing interesting happens, I'll just delete it right then and there. So it never even makes the upload. So generally, I have, in my mind, a built story in all of the clips. I might have anywhere from 50 to 120 clips in any given fishing trip. So that when I uh, download everything off my iPhone onto my computer, I already have the story partially built because I've deleted any of the footage that just wasn't necessary to use or nothing interesting happened. And that process has, has made the editing process far more enjoyable rather than trying to sit through tons and tons and tons of footage that are five, 10 minutes long, which is beca can become arduous trying to find certain moments that might be interesting that you want to share. So that has helped me out a tremendous amount in keeping myself organized. And also I'm building the story literally while I'm fishing, which is fun to do. That's really cool. I've never really thought about deleting footage while I'm out filming. I think I have this sense of like, who knows, there might be like some little thing that, you know, I missed that I'm going to delete. Uh, but you're right. Like I do find that when I come home, you know, one of the first things I do is drop all my footage in and I have to review all of it. And I go through and I like cut out all the little pieces that I really like onto another timeline. And then from that, then I go through it. But like, if I know if I filmed for a couple minutes, like you were saying, and I know that there was nothing interesting happening in it, like, why not just, uh, get rid of it and save yourself some time? Gone. Yeah. That's a, yeah. It really does keep you organized in the editing room when you know that the majority of what you're downloading is something yeah. you're going to use. That's great. That's a great tip. I think one thing that you do really well is your intros and talking to the camera. Um, you talked about how it's spontaneous, but do you have any tips for people that are just getting started of like, you know, A, just getting comfortable talking to the camera and then B, like talking in a coherent way that actually builds your story versus you know, like, uh, Hey guys, I'm, you know, on the river and we're going to go fishing. Okay. See you later. You know? Yes. Um, I do have tips for anyone that's new to filming and might not be comfortable with cameras. And the, the biggest tip that I can give anybody is there, there are two, there are two things. One, when you are filming yourself, a lot of times, um, you're not looking at the lens, right? And that can be very distracting. You're generally are, are, you're looking, I found myself in the very beginning looking at myself. When you play back, it looks like you're looking off to one side or the other. I think it's, it's very difficult to connect with the person that's watching because ultimately you're talking to one person watching the video. So in my mind, I'm talking to one person that's watching the video. And if I'm talking to you, Mark, you know, I'm not looking over your shoulder or, you know, down at your chest. I'm looking, I'm making eye contact and that's super important. That helps just like in, in, in regular social setting, you want to make eye contact with the person that you're speaking to. Next is, um, as soon as I was able to go and it happened quickly, right? That one clip that you'll never see. <laughs> I was like, it was terrible. It was like, hi, I'm fly fish Dan. <laughs> it was so bad. I, I thought to myself, do I speak to that, to people like that, that I meet on, you know, if I'm, if I'm at work or at a social event or out with friends or whatever, do I speak like that? No. So I thought to myself, you know what? There is a real person on the other side of this device. Talk to my device as if I'm speaking to that real person that's on the other side. And as soon as I did that, the world changed, right? I watched myself back and I thought, oh, okay, that's, that sounds like a normal person. That sounds like me. So just like I'm doing right now with you, I'm speaking to you, even if you weren't there and I couldn't look at you, I'm speaking to the camera in a way as if I'm speaking to you in person. And that has made the biggest difference, uh, for me, um, in, in making it 
feel like uh, like a real conversation. And ever since I made that change earlier on, it's just natural because it's just as natural as you talking to another person. If you have that mindset, then it's no different than just talking to a person. I mean, people don't get awkward when they're talking to someone, right? They Everyone can socialize and light up uh, when that happens. So I do the same thing with the camera. It's, I'm talking to a person. I'm not talking to the camera. You know, I've been out fishing with you a few times. Um, and uh, so I, I get to see the the fly fish stand filming process behind the scenes. Um, and I think one of the things that I feel like you were really good about is making sure that you're filming an intro and an outro. Can you talk a little bit about your process on that? So um, that my storyline begins to evolve on the drive out. And a lot of times it's spontaneous, right? Um, I have learned that less is more, right? I want to introduce the person that's take the time to watch the video, where I'm at, what I'm doing and what I'm using, right? And, and what's interesting is me wanting to share all the aspects of, of what I'm doing in any given moment has it was, it was kind of a, um, a benefit that I didn't expect, right. From the person watching, they're like, you know, we really appreciate it. In fact, I think Brian once said, you know, what I like about your videos, Dan, is they're informational, even though it's fun to watch you go to these cool places and catch fish. I'm learning along the way, right. I know what fly you're using. I know what technique you're using. Um, cause you're talking to me while I'm doing it. And, and you're kind of thinking aloud of things that I'm targeting and you find fish there. So it's, it's helpful as well as entertaining. So I want to tell the story and I've always been a pretty good to- storyteller. My kids can attest to that on some of the, a lot of the stories that I told when they were growing up and they still tell me today that uh, they remember those stories that I used to tell. So I want to tell the story, right? So it's, for me, it's almost like an episode where I want to introduce anyone that's watching what I'm doing and where I'm at. And then I want to thank them in the end for taking the time to watch. And a lot of times, if somebody's just discovering my channel for the first time, I'll refer them to another experience, whether it's a tutorial or another place that I might have fished. I'll invite them to watch another video that's on my channel um, that they think might be helpful. So it's, it's interactive for me. And that's, uh, kind of, it's, it's worked for me. It feels natural for me. It feels normal for me. And that's why I do an intro and an outro. And I have a lot of clips in the middle, right? If something, if something, uh, crazy happens or interesting happens, or there might be a change up, you know, I'm telling the viewer in the middle. So it's immersive uh, it could be um, educational and entertaining. And that's why that's why I do do it the way that I do. It just feels natural. When you get done with your video, you're suggesting another video for people to go watch and learn from. Um, from a angler's point of view, um, th- that's obviously more education or more enjoyment for them. But can you talk about um, from the YouTube algorithm point of view, why is that something that's important to do? And that's a really good question, right? Because there, there are things that you need to do on the business side to be successful on YouTube. Before we talk about that, you know, I have to stress that your content has to be good, right? It has to be engaging. Um, you have to learn how to edit. You have to learn how to storytell. You want to be able to connect with your audience in your niche because if you don't have that part, the other part doesn't matter. So if you find yourself with uh, connecting with your audience and you've got good content, um, then the business side, you have to look at click through rate, right? There's, I read a statistic once on, on Google that there are 37 million channels and over 3 billion videos on YouTube. In fact, hundreds of thousands of hours are uploaded every hour of videos. So if you, if you are a viewer yourself on YouTube, you might maybe look at 50 videos uh, or thumbnails of videos to until you choose one to watch. And maybe a viewing session might be four to five videos and then you're done. As a YouTube creator, that's very difficult for you to be 
that video that somebody chooses to watch or the algorithm recommends for that viewer to see. So you have to make sure that you have a thumbnail and that's basically the picture frame of your video that's enticing, right? That somebody would want to click or a title that might create a little bit of a question or, uh, or intrigue or curiosity for somebody to want to click on your video. And then finally, once they decide to click on the video, are they going to just listen to you talk or are they going to get what they clicked for, right? If I'm trying to help somebody cast their fly rod a little bit better, I don't start the video by me just talking about myself or, or fly fishing. I immediately get to the point and tell the viewer, after watching this video, I promise you, you're going to be able to cast your fly rod a little bit better and here's why. I get right into it, right? A lot of a lot of new YouTubers feel that they need, including myself, feel that they need like a like an intro or a, uh, almost like a commercial uh, showing about their channel, like a trailer. Those today are a complete uh, waste of time on YouTube. In fact, most people drop off if somebody has a trailer that's more than three seconds long. They're they're done. They're moving on to the next video. So. There are retention tactics, click-through rate tactics uh, to be able to hold your audience, right? Because you want, especially in today's world, you want to give somebody what they're looking for right away and without all the fluff and stuff in between. So you need to learn what is a good click-through rate. You need to learn to properly title your videos, even to the amount of characters that you use. YouTube gives you 100 characters to use but rarely do you ever, ever want to use that many, right? You want to short it down so that it appears on just the one line when, the, when anyone might be searching for a video. And then finally, you need to be able to optimize your videos to where you're not just going on and on and on and on, right? Our brains respond to changes. So that's why today I use a lot of B-roll, not only to tell the story and be more immersive, but it also helps with keep people engaged with your video. So you want to use a lot of B-roll and it's not just you talking to the camera. So there are a lot of things you can learn. And the cool thing about if you are, if you're going to decide to start a YouTube channel, if anyone decides to start a YouTube channel themselves, you can dig down into the finite minutia of your analytics and understand where your audience is coming from, what device they're watching it on, how long they're watching it, what their age demographic is, uh, when did they drop off? When did they stop watching? When did they skip a part of your video? I mean, you can see everything. And if you see something that's consistent, and in my case, I saw a lot of drop off when I had a channel trailer, I stopped doing my channel trailers and my retention increased, uh, a ton when I stopped doing that, I started to get better at creating thumbnails and my click through rate went from a 3.9 average, 3.9%, which is eh, not great for YouTube, to over 7%. Seems like a low number, but that's actually pretty high for a YouTube channel to have a click-through rate uh, out of 100 people that get introduced to your video, seven people click on it. That's actually really good. And if you don't know those things and understand what influences those things, it's much harder to be successful on YouTube. Because so many new creators are chasing the viral moment, which never comes, right? Which rarely comes. Uh, you have to really concentrate, understand YouTube as a whole. But again, I'm going to go back toward what we've started this conversation with. And that is understanding your audience and providing them with content that they subscribe to your channel for. That's the most important part. Be authentic. Uh, don't try to be somebody you're not. Uh, because people can see through that, right? And part of the reason why I've garnered success on YouTube is because I'm just me. Uh, uh, talking to people that are passionate about the sport. And that comes through, I believe, in, in my videos and, and what I do. It's, I'm no different in person than I am on my videos. And that's the, the biggest takeaway that I would want to give anybody that wants to start a YouTube channel is just be your authentic self. But understand, understand yeah. the analytics, though. So. I think um, it's funny because I have gotten several questions, the same question. Um, 
about, you know, fishing with you and that people often ask me like, is Dan really that positive and upbeat in person? Um, and I'm like, oh yeah. And I think he's even more so in person than he is on his videos. <laughs> I don't want to get too nuts on camera, but yeah, I think it's, um, I get pretty excited when I catch a fish. A lot of people have asked me that too. And, and then they fish with me and are like, wow, I mean, I get amped up. Not only for the fish that I catch, if somebody else gets into a fish, I just, I don't know. It's a, th it's a thrill. And I think people that really have a passion for, for the sport get it. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't let, I don't hold anything back when it's, when it comes to fishing. It's so fun to share that too, because, uh, I just get excited since I was a little kid <laughs> screaming and hollering after I catch a fish. <laughs> I do the same thing now. If, if someone wants to make engaging content, what are three things that they could do to make their content more engaging? So to make a video more engaging, of course, authenticity, right? Get right to the point. Right, the people have decided to click on your video because a lot of times they've searched for something or something has been suggested to them because they searched for things in the past. So get right to it. That's important. I learned to use a lot of B roll. It helps tell the story. So a lot of times half of the clips that I bring home are just random shots of things, right? That I might find interesting when I, what I see when I'm, fishing a certain fishery. So I use a lot of B-roll and I would stay away from any crazy transitions, right? That's distracting, right? When you're watching any movie or TV shows, you don't have a lot of things flipping and things blurring out and zooming in and that stuff doesn't happen, right? So don't, don't be tempted to use all the tools that are in your editing software because you think they might be fun to use because it becomes distracting for the person that's watching it. Audio is super important, both when you're outside and inside. One of the biggest reasons that I've learned that people will turn away from a video is poor audio. Uh, and if you're doing something in a studio setting, you'll notice that I've got lights all around me, right? Because I didn't want this to be a dark environment. Lighting is very important too. If you're gonna be inside of a studio talking to your audience, you wanna make sure you have good lighting because all of those things can distract from a good video and hurt your retention, which then YouTube algorithm sees that people aren't watching as long and they don't recommend it to others. So those are the things that I've done within the video and the editing that, have, that has made my retention 10 times better than it was when I first started. Just learning to tell the story better visually uh, when I'm in, this, in the editing room. Cool. Um what about thumbnails? Do you have any tips for what makes a good uh, fly fishing thumbnail? A lot of times people that are clicking on a fly fishing story, you it's generally the hero shot is what I use, right? So if I've, if, if I've caught a really nice fish or caught some really nice fish, a lot of times the fish are the part, are the thumbnail because it's the hero of the shot. Sometimes I have a, a video launching tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Of course, this probably won't air. This video will be launched long before this, <laughs> this airs. But it's the title is I'm, I'm looking upriver. This is beautiful canyon up in the uh, Cascade Mountains. And, um, you know, the, the volcanic rock and the greenery is just absolutely gorgeous. And Kobe is walking in front of me about 50 yards in front of me. So I just stopped and I took a picture of that. And in the very, in the very middle, I wrote the caption, is this heaven question mark? Because that's what it felt for me in that moment. Like I'm just, this is why I'm out here, right? To experience the outdoors in this way. So I tried to capture that moment in the thumbnail. So if someone is looking for that same experience, that immersive experience to where you're, you're in, you know, God's country and all of its splendor. I tried to capture that in the thumbnail. So I always try to capture either a moment or the hero of the shot being a big fish in the thumbnail so that people have an idea of what, what they're getting into when they click on that video. Nice. Oh, and on, on an analytic side, don't repeat the title of your thumbnail or of your video in the thumbnail. Don't do that. It's redundant. 
So like, for example, I did a video recently that what the title was, if you try this method, it was something like, if you try this method, you'll catch more fish. And in the thumbnail, it said cheating on there. So I always have uh, the thumbnail is complementary to the title, but it's not saying the exact same thing. Nice. That's a good tip. How did you learn how to edit your videos and um, what program are you currently using? And then like what resources did you use or would you recommend for people to learn how to edit? So I am completely self-taught. Um, when I first started, I was using the editing software that came on my HP computer, which was terrible. So I knew I had to quickly uh, level up. So I did a little research, ironically, on YouTube. And I've actually found a creator that's I've been following since that did a lot of Filmora tutorials. So I was looking for something that was intuitive and um, really easy to use. Right? I didn't. I didn't want to get. I didn't want anything that was too technical because I. I felt that I was never going to get to the point where I needed to do anything crazy on the editing side. So Filmora nine check that box and I've been using it since and it's it is a good software it's relatively inexpensive I think I paid maybe 80 bucks and I've got a lifetime uh, use with it it could be a little persnickety right I get the whole pinwheel of death that happens often and I have to close down the app and bring it back up again but once I get a session that's bug free uh, it works pretty well and now that I know it I don't want to switch because today I know it so well that after a full day of fishing and 120 clips, I can create a video with really within a few hours. And I've got a video because I'm, I'm quick at the editing portion of it. Um, you know, and I've learned a lot of the J cuts and L cuts and different transitions and I can piece it together pretty quickly. So that's the software I use. I am completely self-taught. I have used a lot of uh, YouTube to help me with with certain things that I was looking to do. So there's some great resources on uh, resources on YouTube to help you do that. And um, so if there's anyone looking looking for the perfect software, there really isn't you know the perfect software. I just found one that was right for me that that was easy for me to understand, and then I really learned it. And that was the 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 biggest thing when it came to to editing, but. A lot of a lot of the you know editing <clears throat> editing is the the tool or the software that you that you use if you still you know you want to practice and get good at telling the story right so and then un, and then understanding how that relates to your editing software as soon as I learned to tell a better story in the editing room is when things started to to take off for me on YouTube was because I became a better storyteller not that I wasn't already a good storyteller, but it, I was able to build better stories with my editing software uh, and then upload to YouTube and just create something that was more uh, engaging for somebody that might want to watch. You know, I think one struggle I have is when I go out, I, I don't have a story in mind always. And sometimes I just go out and I just sort of shoot randomly and um, I come back and I have a bunch of footage and I'm like, I don't really know what the story is. Some of my favorite videos I really liked because I actually came up with a story that I didn't see when I was actually out on the river. Um, but sometimes I get home and I have zero story and I just have a bunch of footage and I'm kind of like, uh, I don't know what to do with this. I was curious if you ever run into a situation where like maybe either earlier on or maybe sometimes still like, do you end up coming back and you feel stuck or do you feel like you always have a story to, to build? So I, that's a great question. And, and when I'm out there filming, I generally, it evolves while I'm fishing. And I, when I'm, when I'm in that moment and I'm doing my thing out there and I'm fishing, it just kind of comes to me on how I want the video to evolve. And a lot of times the video will evolve as the, as the day evolves itself. So for me, I've always been a good storyteller and, you know, people always talk about telling good fish stories. I can tell a good fish story. So I've always have a plan. Rarely do I ever get home without 
an understanding of what I'm going to create. And that's part of the reason why I can create so quickly is through the course of the day, I have an understanding of the story that I want to tell. So I begin to film B-roll footage to be able to tell that story better. So by the time, and then I think about the day of fishing and how I'm going to tell or put this together on my way home. So when I get into the editing room, it's a very quick process because I've already got the entire storyline worked out in my head from what I thought about before, what happened during, and what I thought about on the way home. So very rarely have I got home and not had a plan. Uh, and sometimes the plan uh, that I have for the day is to not have a plan. I have a, a few videos that I've done voiceovers when I got back home to then tell the story and use the footage to tell the story. Um, one of those videos are that I did was what it must have been like, right? Because I often fish fisheries and I, I think to myself, I go back, you know, what this fishery was like before our influences really changed either the river or the lake forever, right? And I often wonder that. So I, I put together a video probably a, a year and a half ago that really was just a bunch of footage of this pristine fishery up in the Cascade Mountains with my voiceover added to it about something that I think about uh, when I'm out there fly fishing some of these rivers. But even that was somewhat planned. Um, so I, I, have, I can't remember a time to where I got into the editing room with, without already having a plan that I built through the whole process of fishing. Right. What happens when you get into a situation? I think a struggle that I have is like, you know, I go out and I like you, as you're starting the day, uh, you know, you, you're filming like traveling and getting out there. You feel, you film like an intro, but then the day of fishing is like really tough. You know, you maybe catch a couple fish in a day and only maybe some of the time did you have the camera rolling when you actually caught those fish? Like, what do you do to salvage a day like that? A lot of times a day like that will turn into a tutorial. So if I haven't caught a lot of fish or maybe I miss some of the footage, which, which happens, right? If you have a really slow day, if you're running your camera the entire time, you're going to run out of battery no matter what you have. In fact, I now carry, this is a solar powered external battery that happens to fit in my waiter pocket perfectly. <laughs> so when I'm having one of those days where I film so much and so few fish that my battery is running low on my camera, I have a backup that I use. Um, but I've had days like that. And either the video is, it's more about the experience and not so much about catching all the fish. Right. Or I turn it into a tutorial on, on whether it is something that I'm using or something that I'm looking for. And then a lot of times it becomes just reality, right? So I have a video that I'm launching here in a week or so that continues that we talked a little bit earlier about uh, being inspired to just stop somewhere and fish, right? I do the, I have a series that I started last year called Roadside Fly Fishing. So I did another one recently and I didn't catch anything. I mean, I, I stopped at a particular canal that I've been driving over, over and over and over and always wondered, is there a fish in here? And I tried and I said, actually I had the opportunity to catch one, but I was messing with the camera as my fly got eight. And so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't hook the fish. And then I, I went up this river system and just fished and fished and fished and nothing. Now there were salmon, in the river, which I think a lot of times turns off the trout or pushes them up. So I thought to myself, okay, what am I going to do with this video, right? Because I fished uh, that evening and caught zero, right? And I didn't really do anything tutorial wise. So in the moment, I thought, here's an opportunity to reflect back, right? So as I'm fishing and then all of a sudden I'm discovering that there are all these big Chinook salmon in this tiny little fishery, I thought, I, I talked to the audience about, you know, this is pretty cool. And this reminds me of a time that I went fishing last year and hooked in, accidentally hooked into something pretty spectacular. And I flashed back to that video to where I caught that, that big, huge 
zombie sa- salmon played that footage and then came back to present day. So a lot of times if, if, I'm out there fishing, I and I'm having caught any fish, I will flash back to certain moments or certain stories that I can refer back to where I'm catching fish. And now I have a video to where it's real, right? It's we don't always catch fish when you're out there, but I can refer back to a time that I was fishing this spot or a spot like this that I caught this great big fish in and still have content that could be interesting to somebody watching. That's cool. That's a great idea. You know, a trip is never wasted. But if you look on the side of YouTube, if you're not catching fish, then people could argue, well, then that's a wasted trip, right? Nobody wants to watch a video where there's no fish being caught. Well, when you have a library of so many videos and so many clips of fish being caught, you can always talk about a time when during a current trip. And then also be able to have an authentic video of you don't always catch fish, right? Right. And, And that's okay. It's, it's not always about catching fish, right? It's about unwinding and, and having that spiritual connection that I have when I'm out there fly fishing and catching fish is just a bonus. Yeah. Great stuff. Good stuff. This sort of next section, I wanted to talk some of the deeper sort of philosophical things about YouTube and fishing and social media. Um, and so I think one of the things is like, you know, as someone who has a large audience, um, your responsibility around hotspotting, um, you can talk about it as far as like your channel or even just social media in general. That's a great question. And uh, about hotspotting and, and naming the places, right? When I, when I first started my YouTube journey, that wasn't even on the radar. At no point did I, did I ever think that I would get backlash for naming a spot that I was fishing. I mean, it didn't, it didn't even occur to me that that could be a thing, right? Because it was just about me sharing my experience and, and hoping that somebody that might be close enough to this fishery might be able to have the same experience. So that's, that's what it started out. And I got, I got some pretty harsh backlash in a lot of cases when I would name the fishery, especially on a trip that I did on the St. Joe. Orvis had to happen to pick up that particular uh, video that I did because I had some help both from you and from James on the storytelling. It was a great video and they featured it on their Orvis News. Well, most of the comments weren't positive, right? So even though the people that lived in Avery and rely on people coming up and visiting, they love the fact that that video is on there because it just it strengthened their business, right? TFPs gets maybe one or two more customers. The guide might book another extra trip because somebody saw and was inspired to go up there because of my video. So that's the positive side, but the negative side was a lot of a backlash. So I decided it evolved for me. So instead of naming the fishery, and I still do name a few fisheries, right? Everyone in Washington knows the Yakima River. Um, I do want to encourage people to get up to Coldwater Lake and experience that because it's one of the most unique fisheries that we have in Washington. There are still places that I name and it's my choice to name because I just want to share that with people that that follow me on YouTube that I think could benefit from having this experience. But in most cases now, I don't name the fishery because at the end of the day, what I am trying to do on my channel, inspiring others, um, that dose of positive energy, someone to be immersed in a positive environment for eight minutes or 10 minutes, however long the video is. It's not about me offering them a roadmap to wherever it is I'm fishing. It's, it's me inspiring somebody to get out there and either discover a new place for themselves or just get outside and enjoy the sport of fly fishing. So that's, that's what it's been about today and why I've gone away from naming the fishery and just might name the general area. Now, I have had people that have reached out to me privately uh, and not on YouTube that, that that offer me, you know, it's not just, hey, where were you fishing? What lake was that? What river is that? They'll, they'll have a story. They're sharing something personal about their lives or an experience that they've had. And in the end, they might ask me, you know, Maybe you could share if you if you wanted to. Uh, I'd love to know where that place was, type of thing. And I promise to keep it keep it confidential. After that, after them putting a very thoughtful uh, um, story about themselves, uh, 
And in most cases, I have no problem with sharing. I mean, the amount of the, some of the stories that I, uh, that people have told me and, and uh, interacted me with are, they're heartfelt, they're touching, they're humbling. Uh, and I don't mind sharing, uh, uh, if, if it's positioned like that, if somebody's trying to have a personal connection with me, I have no problem with sharing and, and being able to fill that joy in their lives by sharing, uh, where it is. I might've caught that big giant brown trout or cutthroat trout. So, um, I've changed my philosophy a little bit on, on the channel. I'm just randomly naming, naming places for the sake of, uh, somebody click on clicking on the video. And it's more about the, um, the experience and inspiring people to get out there and fly fish. So I've evolved as I continue to grow because I do see both sides, right? I see the one side where people want to know, right? Because they want to be able to experience those same experiences that they're watching me uh, experience on the certain video. But I also understand that some fisheries can be very sensitive, right? And if you broadcast where you're fishing on social media, then everyone is flocking to that space and unfortunately, not everyone is respectful of the environment than, like, for example, I or you you are, right? I, I find myself picking up a ton of trash now when I'm out there because I just, I feel a social responsibility to do it. I want to do that for myself. And, you know, if, I, if I'm going to increase awareness of, of, of places to fish or regions to fish, I want to take a bigger responsibility in helping clean that up and keeping that clean myself and shedding light on on some of the things that I see when I'm out there. A, another a video is I recently posted on salmon fishing. I was just shocked at what I saw when I was fishing this small river over in uh, the Olympic National Forest and the amount of waste and garbage and people discarding full salmons. I mean, the carcasses are fine. I know that's good for the environment, but somebody sizing up, right, and throwing the fish that they already killed back in to, to keep a bigger fish to stay within their limit. Beer cans and lures on the sides of fish because they were obviously trying to snag them. I mean, I posted that video because I wanted I wanted that awareness um, for just people to just have that in their mindset of just taking a little bit more responsibility and, and caring for these fisheries that, uh, that a lot of cases are, are pretty rare these days. So kind of, I kind of got sidetracked from, from your original question of hotspotting, but that's, that's why I decided to, to just to stop naming the fishery, talk about the region, make it more about, uh, inspiring somebody to get out there versus the roadmap. Um, I, that's a great, um, that's a great take on it. And I think, you know, everybody in their fishing journey is learning about, um, you know, even if you're not on YouTube, but just about learning about the way to ha properly handle fish. And, you know, when I first started fishing, I did things that I would totally cringe at and, um, you know, be embarrassed if someone saw me doing that today. But, um, so it's great. I feel like it's great to hear about like your journey as far as the topic of hot spotting and how your philosophy has changed over time. Um, I thought, you know, um, I I'm always a little torn about the topic of a hot spotting because, you know, one of the resources that all of us I mean, maybe not everybody, but most of us use is when we go to, um, you know, let's say we are, we're planning a trip somewhere, we're going to go to Montana, and we want to fish this river. And, you know, of course, before we go, we start researching information about, um, you know, what's the river like, like, what is it like in certain times of year and certain flows? And what does it look like? And, you know, places and, um, and so I feel like all of us, or a lot of people utilize YouTube as a way to like get a sense of what a river looks like. And it's, and it's a resource that I find valuable that I use a lot. And so there's this part of me that is like torn between like, well, if I'm using this resource to do research about it, do I also have any responsibility to also leave information for people that come after me? Like I've used somebody else's video should I be providing information for someone else that's coming next? I'm curious if you have thought about that and if you have any thoughts on that. I have. It, it is um, It is such a, I'm conflicted, 
I mean, if we're being completely candid, um, your point is exactly what I thought in the very beginning about sharing places, right? I know, I know that by sharing the St. Joe, for example, that is a fishery that I think that anyone that's passionate about fly fishing should experience. And I know that the economy, even my reach isn't huge, right? But the limited reach that I do have only helps the people that are are dependent upon people traveling up there and fishing, whether it's the fly shop in town in Avery or TFPs or the guides that guide, the limited guides that guide out of there or the campgrounds that, that rely on revenue to stay open. You know, I, I feel that there's a big benefit, right, to, to, to encouraging people to go to certain places. But on the other hand, right, I, I created my YouTube channel because I wanted a positive distraction for myself and to create that for others. And when I name a spot, there's a lot of negativity that happens on the channel. And I read that and it brings me down in a way. So not naming spots has also been a little bit of self-preservation as well. So that this journey for me continues to be a positive experience. Now, granted, the amount of positivity and relationships that I've forged because of this YouTube channel far outweighs the negative. But some of the comments that are on there, I mean, it, they, they hurt, they can cut. Right. And, and, um, it's like sometimes I want to ignore them, but you can't always ignore those type of comments and, and they can, they can get at you. So I decided to change that philosophy early on and not always name the fishery, but, but you have a great point. You have a great point in there is a, a bit of responsibility, right? In, in, in sharing that knowledge with others so that they can potentially experience it. Um, but yet understand that as an influencer, as you, as you continue to grow, there could be a negative influence on that fishery as well from it being overrun. And then of course, all the things that happen like on that one salmon fishery with all the garbage and unfortunately people that are not like-minded that leave trash behind and, and leave a trace, right. Versus leave no trace. So that's why I've decided that if somebody takes the time to really dig into my channel, discover how they can contact me and then reach out to me thoughtfully about why they might want me to share a particular location. In more cases than not, I'll share the location with that person. So that's kind of the, the new philosophy that I've adopted. Instead of just somebody asking the quick question on YouTube, where is this at? Where are you at? If somebody reaches out to me and figures out how to reach it, because it doesn't take a lot of homework to realize how, how they can reach me. If they do that homework and find out how to reach me and have a thoughtful approach to how they engage with me, I'll be more than happy to share with them. And I think in most cases, the people that really want to know, you know, are resourceful enough to be able to find a way to ask that question in a thoughtful enough manner to where I'll be open to share. And so I've shared a lot of the places that I fish uh, with people that have reached out in that way. So I've found a way to do both without doing one publicly. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I think about, um, our friendship and how it's developed. Um, and you know, I've, I think I've experienced the same problems that you have. I think the very first comment on like, you know, the, one of the first fly fishing videos that I ever did was someone blasting me about hot spotting a place that I had, had listed, you know, and like, I was so excited seeing that notification that like, Oh, someone's commented on your video. And then you go read it and you're like, <laughs> you're just like let down and you're like, wow. Like I put all this effort into this video and, you know, tried to tell the story and all these great shots. And like, that's the one thing that they, they took away from it. Um, uh, you know, and, uh, but, but I coming back to like naming places, you know, you and I never, I don't know about never, but, um, our, our friendship certainly started because I posted a video uh, that about the St. Joe river. Um, yeah. And um, if your wife hadn't found it and shared it with you and 
you know, made you watch it, <laughs> uh, you know, we wouldn't have become friends and we wouldn't, you know, I, uh, we wouldn't have had this. So, uh, you know, that's certainly something that I think about, um, if I had kept all the names, you know, quiet, like who knows, maybe I never, I never would have met you, uh, uh in this way. So. And, I, and you're right. I think, you know, the universe works in mysterious ways. And I think for whatever reason, uh, it wanted to connect us, which I think is pretty cool. Um, but if anyone, you know, the, those, those that are watching and, and really want to understand the power of, of, you know, when somebody is not being very positive, all they do, all they have to do is Google Orvis news, St. Joe and fly fish Dan, and they're going to see the video that they featured and then look at all the comments. And that's, that's one of the bigger reasons why I don't anymore, because they're not, they're not especially kind. And there were some people that came to my defense, which I appreciate uh, on that particular article, but but that'll give you some context of what I'm talking about. But you're absolutely right. If it wasn't for the fact that, that you posted that video, name the fishery, I wanted to fish it for the first time ever, and all those things that had to fall in place, we would have never met. And that would have been a tragedy. So I'm thankful. Thank you for naming the St. Joe Mark because otherwise we would have never met. <laughs> so you're right. It's like, it's this, yeah, it's, there's definitely some conflict there for sure. But, you know, um, today, you know, I met, I met another, um, what I would consider a very close friend and we became, uh, very good friends, friends, fast friends. And that was James Owen, right? he, he was following me for a while on, on social media and commenting and interacting with me and then reached out to me privately and and just gave me a heartfelt message. And, you know, he has a, a great singular wit, great sense of humor. And he said, you know, after he engaged with me for a while, he says, you know, I'll, I'll do a trade with you. I'll help you with your storytelling if you're willing to, to, to name your secret al a subalpine lake. And of course, he sends me a picture of an Emmy. And of course, I'm thinking, you know, what? This am I being catfished here? <laughs> so, and I said, is this real? And then he sends me a picture of five Emmys, and I zoom in on him, and it's his name. And I discovered that James was an, an Emmy award winning producer director for Como News for a lot of years. And Along with your help and his help, he helped me get published on Orvis for the very first time because he gave me a lot of storytelling and editing tips. And in trade, right, I gave him the name of the lake, but we fished it together. And ever since then, I mean, if it wasn't for that exchange and if it wasn't for YouTube, uh, I wouldn't have never met James, right? And and he, I'm so thankful that he's in my life. and. And it's 100% because of YouTube. And that's and that truly has been the one thing that I would never predicted could ever happen, right? From the start with you and your St. Joe video and then me going out on a limb when you invited me to the Yakima River with the, your group of friends and me jumping out of my comfort zone and coming to that, that weekend of fishing, I would have never met all of you and, and these people, I have forged some incredible lifelong relationships because of YouTube. And that is by far the biggest benefit uh, that from from starting this journey are the are the amazing humans that I've met along the way. You know, um, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we see a lot on social media, you know, we post videos in Facebook groups and stuff like that, you know, and there's often a lot of comments, maybe not a lot, but there's often comments about like, oh, the only reason why, you know, you, you did this video or you're fishing or you're filming, whatever is for like the likes and whatever. Um, and you know, I, I sure I, I, it's enjoyable to see people like it and to comment on it and to watch and see, you know, the analytics of people watching a video that you work really hard on and, and people obviously enjoy because lots of people see it. But I think people who don't do this or who haven't been successful at this don't understand that there's all these relationships that get forged because of 
uh, YouTube. And, you know, you talked a lot about, you know, your relationship with James and, you know, how you uh, and our relationship. Um, and, um, you know, I have other uh, people that I chat with um, who I watched their YouTube videos. And, you know, if I'm ever in their area, I'm going to definitely message them and be like, hey, you know, I, I'm I'm going to be in the area. Let's let's fish. Um, and it's only because they put themselves out there on YouTube and shared a part of them. And I put myself out on YouTube and like, you know, we created relationships like that. Um, I don't know if you if you'd be up for sharing, but I know there was a a, a story that you told me about um a spouse of someone that had sent you an email. Um, I don't know if that's a story that you'd be willing to share, but it was yeah, very moving. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it was a, it's a very impactful thing that happened. And in fact, I get emotional just even thinking about it because I had, um, I had a person that was engaging with me um, on Facebook, uh, but they were watching my videos and his name, his name was Roger. And you know, it was just kind of just the typical, hey, thanks so much. I can't get out there anymore. I love watching you fish. You know, it reminds me of when I used to get out there and lots of uh, positive interactions with him. And I hadn't heard from him in a while. And then I got another message and it was from Roger. But in the, this time it was his wife and his wife just wanted to let me know um, uh, that he had passed away and how much joy that I brought to him and his final days and weeks and talked about how he was an avid fly fisherman and couldn't get out there anymore. And he just found that joy in, in watching me do what I do on YouTube. And I mean, it was, it brought me to tears when I read it. In fact, it's, it's, it's still an emotional thing because it's such a, it just brings you down to earth, right? When, when somebody like that messages you and, and says that you had that kind of impact on somebody else, it's a powerful thing. And yeah, it was a pretty, pretty incredible moment and puts a lot of perspective in um, what you're doing, why you're doing it. And it's not about the likes and the views and whatever else. It's, it's the human connection that you get from social media and the power that it has to connect everyone, not only from around the world, but in, in people that it might be going through a hard time or, or in this case, you know, somebody that was in hospice that didn't have much left to, 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 there wasn't much life left to live. And he found a little bit of joy in just watching something that he had been passionate about his entire life. And then to be recognized by his spouse to thank me for just bringing that joy into his final weeks and months. I mean, it was just an incredibly powerful and, and moving moment for sure. And it's, um, I think about that often. Um, and if I ever feel like I'm getting lost and, you know, whether a video is not performing like I, I think it might or should have have. All I got to do is remember that story and it brings me right back down to earth and and reminds me of why I'm really doing this. Right. It's it's not about likes and comments and how many views and how many subscribers and all that other stuff. Right. It, it has it has to do with the the connections and the power of connecting with another human being. And that's and that's really the the most important part. Yeah, that's, um, I think about that story as motivation for myself, even though it didn't happen to me. Um, and so I appreciate you sharing that because, um, it is a powerful, powerful story and it's a great reminder about how, how much impact we can have on people without even knowing it. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it really is. It's, it's humbling. Um, there's, uh, yeah, it's just, a, it's a hard to describe the feelings that I had when I, when I saw that message, but it was just a, uh, like a wow moment for sure. Yeah. And it does, it keeps you centered. Um, I wanted to circle back to another topic around sort of the ethics of, of being a YouTuber and that is fish handling. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts about um, fish handling, what you do to minimize uh, your impact on a fish or a fishery, because, you know, as we know, um, when you're filming, it just takes more time to do everything. It, you know, you're doing two things at once. Um, and so, you know, there are things that I try and do to keep things efficient and not to impact the fish, but I'd love to hear about, 
you know, what you think about it and what things you do. Yeah. And I, and I had to, you know, I too, there were some, you know, um, things that happened earlier on to where I was fishing, I fish all year round and I was fishing in the winter and I had gloves on and I handled the fish and I had somebody reach out to me and said, Hey, you are removing the slime coat, which lessens the likelihood of that fish surviving. It's great that you're doing catch and release, but if, if you're removing that protective slime coat, you know, there's a, a likelihood that that fish will die. And it was just almost ignorance on my part. Like, wow, I didn't even think about that. Right. So I've always had a lot of respect for the fish that I catch and, you know, I try to use, and when I don't forget to pinch the barbs, barbless hooks, um, uh, you know, now I don't ever touch a fish without wetting my hands. I just take that little bit of extra care because when you're on social media and you're on YouTube and you are showing catch and release, right, it's, it's important to really understand all the nuances to keep a fish safe. So I'm very cognizant of that. Now there's a balance, right? I want to be able to show people this beautiful fish that I might've caught. So any time out of the water is limited, right? I, I make sure if I'm going to lift the fish out of the water, I wet my hands first. The fish is out of the water for no more than a couple of seconds. They're right back in the net. I don't stage any of my shots either, which I know that, you know, the more time the fish is in captivity, the more stress it's going to have. So I do try to get the fish out of the net as quickly as I can. And sometimes it's just that it's in the net, it's unhooked and I let her go. But if I have some fish that's pretty spectacular that I might want to show off, I'll lift out for just a second and then put it right back into the water after wetting my hands. So I know that there's a balance right of being able to share uh, what you're doing and, and or the fish that you caught versus the safety of the fish. And I try to lean towards the safety of the fish every single time. With also keeping perspective as well, you know, um, like, for example, um, just a couple of days ago, I caught a bull trout. Now, as much as I want to lift that fish off, up and show everybody, I know that bull trout are threatened in Washington, and there's no way that I'm going to lift that fish out of the water for the sake of somebody getting maybe a little bit closer look at it, because I know that those fish are threatened. Um, there are not a lot of them uh, in Washington and I'm going to do every single thing I can to care for that fish. Some of the fish that I know that are stocked, if I'm catching a triploid trout or a stocked fishery, which I, which I know that really these fish are there for our enjoyment and sport, I'll lift that fish up, respecting the fish, but showing the viewers and then quickly putting it back into the water. So it also kind of depends on, on the fishery that I'm fishing and whether the fish is wild or the fish is native. Um, yeah, it, it, I take, I take even more care in those circumstances, but always respecting the fish and make sure that I'm showing proper fish handling. That's great. That's a great answer. Um, yeah. you know, I think one thing, um, people can think about too is, um, you know, different angles than, than the, than the hero pose of, you know, holding a, holding a fish up and, and holding it in front of the camera. Um, you know, I, I see you do it a lot. And, you know, that was one of the reasons why you got the GoPro was, um, getting that underwater shot instead of maybe instead of, you know, getting that instead of maybe holding the fish up, um, or, um, you know, maybe instead of holding the fish up, you just get your camera ready and you get that release out of the net, you know? Um, so, I think there's other angles that people can think about. I don't know if, if there's any other sort of shots or angles or ideas that you use um, besides the hero shot, but. Yeah, and for me, I think it's a, it's like a little pet peeve. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab a picture right here. So notice, notice this fish right here. It is not being held like this. <laughs> it can't stand the whole, the tea kettle thing. The tea kettle. Think. <laughs> I don't like that. It's unnatural. I think it's it's unnecessary, right? It's definitely, I think, for Instagram. I don't know who started that, but I'll never do it for the record. <laughs> I try to just naturally hold the fish up if I'm going to show it and then just put it right back into the water. Or like you said, arguably, well, I know because I've seen it, the underwater release is far more artistic and beautiful than holding a fish up, right? Because the, the fish is underwater and you have the brilliance uh, especially if you have a clear water type of fishery, it's pretty spectacular to see the fish just, it, that looks way different underwater than it does 
out of the water, right? right? But if I'm going to hold a fish out of the water, I'm just going to quickly hold it up. I'm not going to tea, tea kettle it. I'm going to show the viewers. I'm going to quickly put it back into the water. Just, so you will never see me do the tea kettle thing because I just think that just, I don't know, just adds an element of stress to the fish that they don't need. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. If you were to um, go back in time um, and you were to tell your new YouTube self a couple tips to like jumpstart them, what would you tell, tell yourself? Uh, that is a great question. If I can go back and, and, and we're just talking about YouTube in general and talk, talk to myself when I first started, I would have taken, um, I would have learned how to edit. I would, I would have, instead of learning as I go, I would have studied a little bit more before starting, right? I would, I would learn the software prior. I would understand YouTube better than I did in the very beginning. Because for me, YouTube was just a, a platform that you threw a video on and you hope somebody watched it. Well, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, study that should happen prior. And if you take the time to really learn YouTube, the platform itself, you will garner uh, a lot more success a lot faster by doing that, right? Still, again, you have to be your authentic self. You have to make sure that you're that you're uploading things that are within your niche and stay within that niche. And has you have to be authentic. All those things have to happen. But I would have understood the platform better um, than I than I, than I just went into it with not really understanding at all. So I would have been a little bit more studious in the beginning and understanding how YouTube worked versus just jumping in without doing any homework at all. Yeah, I think that um, studying YouTube and the audience of YouTube is really important. And I think um, I learned it the hard way. Um, when I started out, I, I one of my first real projects, I think this had, might have been my third video I had put together. Um, was a short film I called Tenkara Kid. And that was inspired by my older daughter. Um, and it was a short film and I submitted it to a short film contest that Rio had put on and, you know, got through all these rounds and ended up, you know, winning um, the grand prize. And I got to fly out and I got to fish with, you know, Simon Gosworth and, uh, you know, Phil Chavez and all these guys at, at Rio, these legends. Um, and, you know, I was like, oh man, you know, YouTube's going to be easy. Like this was my, this is my third video I've made and like it, people are going to love it, you know, and I put it up on YouTube and it didn't, didn't go anywhere. It was not great video, know, by the way, I've seen it. I, I, I awesome. appreciate that. But I think it, I think there's this, um, I think this idea of audience is so important because obviously in a short film contest, in that context, it was it was good and it was geared towards that audience, but as geared towards an audience on YouTube, it just, it, it isn't the same thing. Um, I know that you, um, I know your videos vary as far as, um, being artistic and being made for YouTube. And I'm curious at your thoughts on how you balance that sense of like, Oh, I'm, I'm making something that's artistic or I'm making something for the YouTube algorithm. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think about it in those terms. Okay. Um, the 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 content that I make, I feel, is what the audience that has taken the time to subscribe to the channel want to see. And there are subjects, there are some subjects that do better than others. Like, um, for instance, I started a not every Friday, but every most every friday i'll do a fly gear and beers where i'm just talking about something that's new in fly fishing or something that might be new to me or something that i discovered that doesn't necessarily do very well right because there's there's a there's only a certain amount of people that have subscribed to the channel that really look forward to that series but even though you know if you look at the youtube ranking i might get a 10 out of 10 or a 7 out of 10 on the last 28 videos that I've, uh, or last videos that I've released in the last 28 days as far as performance. And typically somebody might think, oh, great, that video bombed. I'm never going to do something like that again. 
But I continue to do it because I know that there is an audience for it. There is a portion of the people that have subscribed to my channel that might want to watch it. So I do it for them, right? I have a subscriber right now that that has been asking about uh, me putting a video together because I fly fish all year long about the layers that I put to keep warm. And I'm going to do that for that viewer. And that that video might get just a handful of views, but I've got somebody who's taking the time to subscribe to the channel that have openly asked me to make this video, so I'm going to make it. So I don't necessarily, um, the only, and let me, let me retract that, there is one type of video that I do make that speaks to the algorithm, and that are YouTube shorts, right? When, when YouTube shorts, which are the same as Instagram reels or TikTok videos, it's YouTube's version of that. I discovered early on that that was in, in beta testing. I got in early. I, it didn't matter how big your channel was. YouTube would show that content. So it helped with my discoverability. So those videos were made with the YouTube algorithm in mind for discoverability. But they are zero to 60 second videos that are filmed in a portrait type of setting, right? Something that tip most people that watch long format videos wouldn't necessarily watch, but something perhaps I could reach a different audience uh, for people that do watch the more shorter content. So I did produce those specifically for YouTube, but if I'm looking at long format videos, I know that some subject matter may garner more views than others, but I still cover everything because I feel like I have a responsibility to do that and I want to do that myself. So. I may have a subject that may not resonate with everybody, but may resonate with some, and that's okay for me. So I don't necessarily think about on the long format, what video can I make to blow the YouTube algorithm, right? I, I think about what video can I make uh, that's smartly titled, that is a good thumbnail, that'll resonate with the people that have subscribed to my channel. So that that's my philosophy in it. And I think, Mark, honestly, I believe that that, authentic approach is why I continue to grow because I'm not trying to beat the system or, or just produce something that, you know, throw my float tube off a dam and Hey, I'm fishing this lake today. You know, like we've joked about in the past to get the viral moment. Um, and that's why the community that I build is so engaged, right? Everyone engages with me. Uh, and my engagement is really good because I've taken a long time to build a very engaged community by just having a thoughtful approach on what I what I uh, upload, not trying to beat some sort of algorithm. Shorts is the only thing that I've, I've utilized to help with my discovery um, because I knew YouTube would send that out to more people that, that it might be passionate about fishing or fly fishing. And those are the only type of format videos that I really, uh, that I produced ever really try to cater to YouTube versus the audience. Awesome. Well, I know we're getting close to probably two hours of talking. Um, and so I, I appreciate your time. I've got a, a couple more uh, quick questions for you uh, from people that su that submitted some questions. One is, what's your favorite brand of cigars? <laughs> people are going to be disappointed when they hear that. Um, uh, I <laughs> Because I'm not a... I'm not a connoisseur when it comes to cigars, but I do enjoy a cigar. I think James Owen said any cigar that he gives me, which is true, because he, he did have a couple of Cubans that smoked really well. But my go-to cigar is the full-size Havana Honey. And for me, it's just, uh, I like the little bit of flavor uh, because cigars can, can sometimes be a little bit harsh. Um, I don't smoke a ton of cigars and I generally only smoke them when I'm fishing. Uh, but Havana honeys have always been my go-to, which I know is not glamorous at all in the cigar world. But you know what? I'm going to answer honestly, and that's what it is. Nice. You're going to get cases of Havana honeys now uh, shipped to your uh, PO box. <laughs> I hope so, because I'm almost out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Another question that's on that similar vein is what's your favorite whiskey? You know, again, if we're being completely candid with one another, I have a hard time with whiskey. <laughs> I'm I'm more of a vodka guy. I, I do enjoy the Tito's vodka. Um, I've enjoyed some 
some whiskeys before, right? Uh, Dry Fly makes one. It's like a wheat whiskey, which is really good. They're out of Spokane. Mm-hmm. But every time that I enjoy a whiskey, I just get ridiculous heartburn. So, so unless I've got a bottle of Pepsi next to me, uh, drinking whiskey always leads to just ridiculous heartburn for me. So I typically avoid it. But if I were to name one whiskey, I really do enjoy the the Dry Fly. Are you familiar with that one from out yeah. of Spokane? Yeah, yeah. It's they make a great wheat whiskey. Cool. But I'm more uh, of a vodka. All right, good to know. All right, uh, Dry Fly, Streamer, or Nymph. What would be your uh, your if you could only do one of those for the rest of your career? What would it be? Oh no, that's a that's a that question is not even fair. <laughs> <laughs> Dry Fly, Streamer, or Nymph. All right, so nymphing can be a little bit boring, right? Because it's under an indicator, even though it's fun to watch the bobber go down, right? Because uh, when I was a kid, right, I used to bobber fish all the time and there's nothing more exciting than watching that thing go Voop! because of a fish. And a lot of times you have a nymph under a bobber. So that, that's a tough one, but there's also nothing like a dry fly eat, right? When you see your little fly floating down the river or on, on the lake and a fish just comes up and explodes on it, that's pretty thrilling. Streamers, I've gotten really good at fishing the streamers and I had been fishing the the Sculptzilla. I'm now fishing the the trailer sculpin um, from Red's Flies. They're very similar. Uh, one's a family-owned company, though, which I appreciate. It's the Red's Flies, so I'm using that now. That's fun because you can't really see what's happening, but when you're moving that thing underwater and you're doing, you know, whether it's an upstream cast or you're swinging it, that unexpected slam of generally a big fish is exciting. But if I had to pick one and I'm literally choosing in the moment based off of an experience I had at, can I name fisheries on here? I was up in a very large alkaline lake in, in uh, Northeastern Washington up in the Okanagan. And I got into some Lahontan cutthroats on a dry fly. And Kobe and I were so thrilled at what we were experiencing because it was so rare and the fact that we were catching them on this dry fly, and it's so visual, right? Because you throw the dry fly out and the fish will turn and will come up at it or slowly roll on it or slam it. I think if I had one type of fly to fish for the rest of my life, it would be dry fly. Cool. Big ones, too. Big we're ones. talking Chernobyl size. <laughs> <laughs> Not nice. the little ones you can't see you can, and, you know, have to tie on with 6X. Not those. All right. So wrapping up. Um, really appreciate you taking the time out of your Friday night and, uh, spending it with me job boning about fishing and YouTube. My pleasure. Uh, I look forward to the next time we get to get out in the river, um, and, uh, do some fishing together. Um, what are future plans for you that people want, should know about future plans? So, um, my next big trip happens to be with you and that is, uh, in October to the St. Joe. And I am super looking forward to that trip. And I'm going to try to do something a little different because the last time we camped together, I brought my five person tent, my queen size blow up mattress. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's a bit of a glamping, but you know, I'm tall and I need support on my back, blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm going to try to go, uh, far more, uh, minimalistic on this trip. So, um, but I'm looking forward to that trip. And that's, that's probably one of the bigger trips that I have on the horizon. Uh, if we're looking into, Next year, my wife and I are planning to go back to Maui. So we haven't been back to Maui um, for three years since COVID. And next year, we're going back to Maui, which uh, opens up the opportunity to bonefish. And that is something I'm super excited to share with everyone that's on the channel is because I've got bonefish locked down. And um uh, I just manage to catch a ton of bonefish whenever I go to Hawaii. And Maui is one of the most uh, notoriously hardest places to catch bonefish. Uh, but but I've, I've got the secret locked down, and I'm looking forward to sharing that with everybody. So that'll happen next year. But in the near term, i got two trips, the one with you to the St. Joe. And in November, I'm going to be at Pyramid Lake trying to catch a 30-pound Lahontan cutthroat. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Freezing um, my butt. 
I people should already sort of know how to find you, but where what's the best place if people don't know where where to find you? So if you go onto YouTube, I'm I'm really primarily in um, four spots. So of course YouTube, Fly Fish Dan, easy to find on YouTube. Uh, I've been dabbling a little bit in Instagram. Same thing under Fly Fish Dan, sharing a few reels and interacting with people. It's mostly uh, for messages and connecting with people that way. I'm pretty big on Facebook as well, um, which I think is the platform that my generation generally is on. So I'm on on Facebook quite a bit. And I also have a website as well at flyfishdan.com. Very cool. Well, thanks again, Dan, so much for spending so much time. And um, I had a lot of fun and and uh, look forward to our St. Joe trip. My pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much for having me on. And this is my first official interview podcast, whatever we want to call it. But <laughs> thank you uh, for uh, for providing me with this first experience. I appreciate it. Uh, that's awesome. Well, I get to be the guy that says, I remember when Fly Fish Dan had his first interview and, you know, when you're, <laughs> when you're big and famous and and uh, and I, I can have this uh, footage around. So <laughs> I can only hope <laughs> hopefully one day I'll do this for a living. That's what that's. So when I so when somebody asks me if I've got a job, this is it. That that would be awesome. Wouldn't it be? Yeah. Um well, and you're and you're doing a great job, uh, hopefully working your way towards that. So and and then you can hire a dedicated cameraman to uh, come help you. <coughs> and yep. uh, uh, yeah, Be number one on that list. <laughs> and then and then we can we can travel around around the world uh, filming uh, fly fish Dan episodes. So wouldn't that be glorious? Oh, that would be so cool. <laughs> we, we can dream. We can dream for sure. But you know what? You bring about what you think about. And I'm going to get there. Well, thanks again, and for everyone, have a good night. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Flyfish Dan. If you want to see more interviews of content creators, leave their names down in the comments below. Consider liking and subscribing to this, and we'll see you in the next one. Mm-hmm.